Peace. What's up? This is your brother, Mr. Holipsism, here to do a show for you tonight. And the show is titled, Why Hasn't an African American Fund Been Created Yet? The description for the show reads as following Everybody is screaming, Black Power. And there have been two million man marches in 20 years. But there's an old saying in politics that goes, whatever you subsidize, you get more of. Why don't all of these people screaming black power and nationhood at the top of their lungs put their money where their mouth is? On this show, we will discuss the hypocrisy of refusing to invest your money in nationhood while simultaneously paying taxes to support the land, infrastructure, and nationhood of your enemy. We will also discuss why the lack of an African-American fund, or the absence of a suggestion of one, is an indictment against so-called black leadership. Also, What exactly would an African-American fund accomplish for black African people in America? Now, what I want to do is I want to play something for you because this goes in hand with this show topic and it kind of sets things up. Um, There's a few things that I want to go through after I play this clip for you. And this is from a video that I did um, on my old channel, the channel that I was working off of when they, you know, deleted my whole lipsism channel, my main channel that I'm on right now. And the title of the video was called um, You Get What You Pay For. And um, I want you to hear this and see the points, the talking points, and the, the things that I go through because it ties into the show title. Okay, so I'm going to play this for you guys, and then after it's over, I'm going to come back, and I want to give you some more stats. But take a listen to this. Let me bottom line this for those in the cheap seats. We are all full of shit. Let me explain why I would make such an inflammatory and offensive statement about all black African people in the United States, specifically myself included. Wrote a song about it, like to hear it, here it go. When the U.S. government first implemented a personal income tax back in 1913, the vast majority of the population paid a rate of just 1%, and the highest marginal tax rate was just 7%. If African Americans alone, not counting Africans throughout the diaspora, invested 1%, of $1.1 trillion in infrastructure municipal bonds, that would be over $10 billion a year. Here's a little short list of the type of taxes and fees individuals, and I'm talking about personal consumer taxes and fees, not business tax and taxes and fees, pays to the United States government. Federal income tax, state income tax, Local income tax, employee social security tax, your employer pays the other half. Employee Medicare tax, your employer pays the other half. Property taxes, road toll charges, state sales tax, driver's license renewal fee, TV cable slash satellite fees and taxes federal telephone surtax, excise tax, and universal surcharge, state telephone excise tax and surcharge, telephone minimum usage and recurring, non-recurring charges tax, gas slash electric bill fees and taxes, water slash sewer fees and taxes, cigarette tax, alcohol tax, federal gasoline tax, state gasoline tax, Local gasoline tax, federal inheritance tax, state inheritance tax, gift tax, bridge toll charges, marriage license, hunting license, fishing license,
bike license fee, dog permit slash license, state park permit, watercraft registration and licensing fees, sports stadium tax, bike slash nature trail permit, court case filing fee, retirement account early withdrawal penalty, individual health insurance mandate tax, hotel stay tax, Plastic surgery surcharge, soda slash fatty food tax, air transportation tax, electronic transmission of tax return fees, passport application slash renewal fee, luxury and gas guzzler car taxes, new car surcharge, license plate and car ownership transfer taxes, yacht and luxury boat taxes, jury taxes and surcharges, state slash local school tax, Recreational vehicle tax, special assessments for road repairs and construction, gun ownership permit, kitty tax, that's IRS form 8615, fuel gross receipts tax, waste management tax, oil and gas assessment tax, use taxes on out-of-state purchases, IRA rollover tax slash withdrawal penalty. Tax on non-qualified health saving account distributions. Individual and small business surtax. Estimated income tax underpayment penalty. Alternative minimum tax on income. Now, here's a list of the amount of taxes black African people pay to their black African diaspora nation to help build hard infrastructure, and soft infrastructure institutions to assist with all the socioeconomic and political problems and issues they bitch, moan, complain, and get a snotty nose and teary eyes over. Zero. Zip. Zilch. Nada. <laughs> this isn't rocket science, people. This is why I always say there is no problem in the so-called black community. There is no problem. Everything is exactly what it's supposed to be because this is the way the collective consciousness wants it to be. Like I said before, there shouldn't be any surprise when a Negro manufacturing machine manufactures Negroes. If the collective consciousness truly wanted to produce functional black African people, then those functioning mechanisms would mechanisms would be present within the existing black African culture, which we know it is not. <laughs> There's an old economic quote that has withstood the test of time. Whatever you subsidize, you get more of. The taxes I listed are what black African people subsidize the United States government with. I haven't even begun to talk about what we subsidize with the money the government allows us to keep after taxes. Are they not merciful? Do not make the mistake of thinking $1.1 trillion worth of spending power equates to wealth because it does not. It merely means we are one of the top consumer groups on the planet. The amount of money we dedicate to savings or investments is insignificant to what we spend, but I digress. My point of this entire video is that before you start demanding the black nationalist community to produce concrete and tangible infrastructure and institutions to benefit the black African nation that you don't even support or agree with, and before you start expecting people to map out the socioeconomic and political blueprint for nationhood in their spare time after they work within the context of the system you support with your tax money, to provide, clue, to provide food, clothing, and shelter for themselves and their family. How about you stop being a hypocrite and invest the same amount of your money you pay in taxes to the United States government for its infrastructure, its institutions, and its sustainability to your own black African nation for its infrastructure, its institutions, and its sustainability? Oh, yeah, that's right. You can't do that. Why? Because it doesn't fucking exist. Not only does it not exist, but you don't even believe that it should exist. So in conclusion, as far as the so-called struggle 
for black African people in America is concerned, how's that working out for you? Good luck with that. One. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Um, let me bring in my brother Dev if he's ready. Hold on, let me see. Yeah, what's up, man? Yeah, Dev, you there? Yeah, I'm there, bro. You hear me? Mm-hmm. You ready to come yeah. in or you want me to put you on hold? Um, no, nah, I I talk for a few minutes. I'm in here cooking, you know, just cooking and stuff for the mall. But um Okay. For my mom um, now. I just wanted to um, go over some some figures here and get your um, take on this. I posted this up in the BAIO um, Ning group. Um, mm-hmm. It's titled, I'm Not a Mathematician, but there are approximately 44 million people who classify themselves as black African in the United States. Um, if an African-American fund was created, with full online transparency, and every black African person in America invested $10 a month towards their own government and the infrastructure of their own nation, that would be about $440 million each month. $440 million times 12 months equals $5.28 billion each year. Now, this money would go into a hedge fund And you can actually get a line of credit five times the principal. So that's five point twenty eight billion each year times five. Twenty five billion, close to twenty 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 billion, twenty five billion dollars, close to. Now, since we know you can never get one hundred percent of people to do anything, let's cut that figure in half, and you have about two point six four billion dollars each year. Same thing applies. This money would go into a hedge fund, and you could get a line of credit five times the principal. So it would be five times two point two six four billion. So about twelve, thirteen million dollars, billion dollars. But who are we kidding? You can't get half people to do anything. So let's cut it down to a quarter of the of the forty four million black folks in America. That is still one point three two billion dollars for the year. Same principle, this money would go into a hedge fund, and you can get a lot of a line of credit five times the principle. But who are we kidding? We all know that out of the 44 million black people in America, only about 5% really want a nation of their own. So if 5% of the 44 million is 2.2 million people, if all of them were invested um, $10 a month, which comes out to about 0.3333333 cents a day toward their own government and the infrastructure of their own nation, that would come out to about $22.2 million a month, which works out to 266400000 per year. And like we said before, this money would go into a hedge fund, and you can get a full line of credit, you know, five times the principal. Now, my question is, why hasn't this been suggested by any of the black leaders or black leadership? This is a rhetorical question? No, I I seriously want to answer. Like, what do you feel? Because they're too busy being paid off by this country. They don't want to have their own. They're happy and complacent with what they have here. So why why, why would you even think on a level of doing something yourself when, when daddy's taking care of you? I just let daddy continue to take care of me. I don't, want to have, to, I don't have to work. It's cold, you know. It's, it's easier and lazier that way. I mean... I've always questioned this, and I remember when um, the first Million Man March happened, Farrakhan had had suggested a similar plan. 
And when he and that was the one thing that I took out of the Million Man March when of the first Million Man March when I was there. And he said that if you can get a fund together where people can can invest that ten dollars a month, he said that we would have enough money. Now he wasn't speaking in terms of nationhood, like you know, an independent nation state like we are. He was saying that we can use that money to basically finance and control all of these organizations that claim to be working for us. We will be able to pay them and, you know, like they say, whoever um, pays the pipe or calls the tune. Cool. We know how it works in, in in American politics. If you ain't if you don't have payoff money, you don't get nothing done. Right. So he said if we had the money, we could pay off, like, let's say, um, our politicians who claim that they want to um, do things for us to get our vote. But then when they get into office, they don't pay us any attention. That's because we didn't put any money in their pockets. Right. You know, if you're putting money in somebody's pockets and you help them get on, they can't just ignore you. Right. And that's what Farrakhan suggested, and I remember that. And I actually thought that it was a good idea at the time. Right. Um, the only thing that I would do differently is I wouldn't, I wouldn't waste my time um, trying to be involved in American politics. I know, people, I know that some people don't agree with me on that, but I don't see any Korean um, Malcolm X's. Right. I don't see any Korean activists. I don't see any Chinese Al Sharptons. As a matter of fact, the Asians are, are virtually invisible in American politics. I mean, I really don't see any Asian politicians. Yet, the Asians are doing very well in America. Now, why is that? Could it be that... um? They're a satellite community in the United States, and they deal directly with their nation state in China, in Korea. They're so busy doing direct trade, they don't really give a damn about American politics. Exactly. Because they always have the money to sustain their community and to actually have a community. <laughs> Brother Minister. Really? Was there a we're point talking. you wanted to make? Because I wanted to ask you something, but I wanted to make let you make your point first, if you wanted. Uh, sure, sure. I do. I do want to answer your question, uh, but I called in to give my two cents on why there, because I really, really like this topic. Why there is no African American uh, fund? Okay, so for me, uh, I believe the answer, from my perspective and my experience, is, is muddy waters. And uh, mm. I say muddy waters because. Just as you brought up the example of the Million Man March, you know what I'm saying? I think right. that there's just been so many people to say they have uh, the, the above-mentioned, the aforementioned funds, but it turned out not to be. You know what I'm saying? There's been a lot of people out there that says, if you give to this particular fund, this building fund, this, this whatever fund, we will do this, and this, and that for you. These two are Go ahead, Big Brother. But one of these two. Uh, on the cabinet. Huh? Did we lose him? Oh, my bad, bro. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I just tried to put my phone on mute. Okay, go ahead, Minister. Uh, what you call? Um, well, what I'm saying is that there's been so many people that said they had this fund, they did not have it. Now, you mentioned the uh, the Million Man March and the whole. Uh, if you give $10 and all that other stuff, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We gave to so many different leaders $10, $10, $10, $10. $10. And what ended up happening was they did not do what they say they was going to do. And so, you know, I've seen that because I've been active in the movement since 1991. You know what I'm saying? So this leader will come and say they were going to do this, and this leader will come and say they were going to do that, and blah, 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 blah. And nobody ever actually did not, none of that. You know, I, I, I want to tell a short story, like a quick story, as an example. When I was younger, we had this brother in the temple, and uh, he was like, um, 
basically he was from a satellite city. Like, you know, Albany is the, is the middle of the capital region, and then you have Schenectady and Troy. And I actually live in Schenectady. And so, therefore, he lived in Troy. And him and his wife, he was the head of the NAACP out there, and his wife was the head of the Urban League, but they were both Muslims. So you can imagine we were controlling that particular organization from the nation, and that's periodically what we would do is, like, you know, in all cities we would flood, you know, the, the, the quote-unquote Negro organizations with Muslims, and therefore, you know, when there came time to vote, it was just like 90% Muslims on the board, and they would make a vote, you know what I'm saying, to, to try to push these black organizations to a more nationalist perspective. So to make a long story short, brother had this big meeting, had all sorts of white people and black people there, gave this, this, this large speech, and got a boatload of money. First thing this Negro did is he went and bought him a Hyundai. The second thing he did is he went and bought himself a coat and some shoes and stuff like that. So for me, this is a lot of what happens, and this is why I label black organizations as black power plantations because they are built to absorb as much as black people's money as they can, but they are not designed to do what they say they're going to do, and they're not designed to really bring you to an end game. but they've been saying that they have been collecting money to do exactly what you're talking about right now for years, mm -hmm. but none of them have ever done that. You know what I'm saying? Dare I say it, that... You know, Million Man March, what was that supposed to lead to? It was supposed to lead to the very thing that you're talking about. It did not. You know what I'm saying? Right. And, and then we started hearing, well, you know, uh, we needed the money that we had to defray the cost of the march, and, you know, that was just a drop in the bucket and blah, 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 blah. Okay, all right, whatever. Let's just say that was true. We'll grant you that. You know what I'm saying? My thought, brother, is, is that in addition to this, and I hope that this doesn't sound like it's unrelated, but it is. You know, a lot of people nowadays that we, you know, newer cats that come on the scene are trying to say that they're the one that's going to lead black people to, quote, unquote, black empowerment or black African empowerment or whatever. In my judgment, if you can't draw the amount of people that Farrakhan drew to that Million Man March or the second Million Man March and have that amount of people throw money in your bucket, then you damn sure ain't who you say you are. <laughs> Agree? Mm. Agree. You understand? I mean, we can yeah, rail against we can rail against all these black leaders and say they ain't this and that, but when these fools call, people come and people drop money in the bucket. If you are who you say you are, if you are actually better than all these other people, you should be able to do the same thing. But you can't. And you are struggling right. to get to two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars. So for me, my answer to your question is, brother that the reason why we don't have an African-American fund is because the, mud, the waters are so muddy. And I may, I, may, I may say this, and then I'm going to, you know, answer your question. You see, we were supposed to have a next generation of brothers and sisters to come through, you know what I'm saying, directly you know, like sons and daughters of the 90s movement and the 80s movement is what we're supposed to have. But the, the waters were so muddy from the corruption and crooked Negroes who were running these organizations that this next, this, uh, what they call it, um, the Y generation, I'm not sure what generation we're in at this point, but the millennial generation brothers, the millennials, there you go, my bad. These millennial brothers and sisters are so fed up with the BS that they had to grow up under the lack of, uh, the lack of food, the lack of money, the lack of resources, watching their mothers and fathers give all the time and money to these organizations, and they was in poverty, and to not see anything physical that they could touch or that they could actually claim that their own, they don't want to be a part of it. So when you give a call and you say, hey, <clears throat> let's put together a fund and let's try to build a black Chinese or uh, Chinatown, or let's try to build a black Wall Street, they say, yeah, my mother and father gave to that BS. You niggas don't know what you're talking about. I'd rather turn up and listen to Bobby Smurda and the rest of them. And what, 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 what are you going to say to them? You can't say that y'all are wrong. You can't. Yeah. So to me, you know, if there's going to be some kind of African-American fund for us to have land infrastructure nationhood and a separate nation of our own, then quite frankly, it's going to have to start with the older people, not because the younger people ain't worthy or because they are not um, useful. It's because they are so jaded by what they saw us uh, not do but say we was going to do. They ain't not going to give money to nothing like that until they see a substantial amount of money being put towards 
something, anything that they could touch, and then they'll say, that's hot, I'll jump on top of it. Because these brothers and Smith sisters are way smarter than we are. They way smarter at their age than we were, and they ain't falling for the BS. So if they see, all right, man, they, they actually got this, they got that, I flew over there, I seen this, I flew over there and I seen that, then they would give to it. But the water has been so muddy and they are so jaded and some bitter and hurt. Like if you if you heard if you ever heard Polite, which I'm pretty sure we all familiar with Polite, if you ever heard him talk about <clears throat> his early experience with the Nation of Islam, the Moors and said other organizations, you would understand why these young brothers and sisters don't want to give no money. Mm-hmm. Because yeah, he'll tell I've you, like, I was out that. there. What's that, my brother? I've always said that. It's like, um, I don't, I'm one of these people that I like taking responsibility for my part in the, in the, in the struggle. You know what I'm saying? Right. Because I noticed right. a lot of people will blame the older generation. A lot <laughs> of people will blame this generation. I take responsibility and I look at my generation. Right. I think my generation right. is yours, right? Generation X. Yeah. Yes, sir. And yes, sir. we dropped the ball. No doubt. Bottom line, we dropped the ball. And 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 I and I take full responsibility. I cannot, you know, add any caveats to that. I'm just saying it is what it is because when our people despite um our feelings about, you know, integration and civil rights, that generation before or I should say a percentage of them because not all of them Negroes was involved. You know, mm-hmm. everybody wants to right. you know, come and say that they were involved in civil rights when really they were just along for the ride. But at least mm-hmm. there was a group of people that were out there and involved in activism. Right. We decided at some point, and I think it was around the time when um, um, Puff Daddy turned into P. Diddy and when Jay-Z came out, mm-hmm. <laughs> where <laughs> the vibe turned into, if you remember this, the vibe turned into, I remember when Public Enemy was out, there was um, a vibe in the music that they were dealing with the crack era. And they right. were dealing with it from the perspective of what the crack was doing to the community. So right. you saw a lot of right. crackheads, you saw a lot of damage from the drug game. When right. Jay-Z and Biggie and all of them came around, it you didn't even see what the effects of crack in the community. What you saw was a drug dealer in the club. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know exactly. what I'm saying? All you saw was him yes, running with the globes, tipping champagne, and whatever. And the vibe went from that to more money, more problems. That song mm-hmm. is really like a real paradigm shift in hip-hop. People don't realize that. Because think mm-hmm. about the concept. You got poor folk. I remember, I'll never forget this. It was the summertime and that song was out. And I'm sitting over there in Clinton Hill, that, that park over off of Fulton on Clinton, mm-hmm. where they play basketball. Oh, you talking about my dad used to live over there. Yep. Yeah. And I'm standing there, and, I'm, and they, they had like a cookout, and people is in the park, and they're blasting more money, more problems. You got a bunch of poor folks mm-hmm. in the ghetto. Mm-hmm. Dancing around, talk about the more money we talk about, the more problems we see. I'm like, what is Mm -hmm. going on? I felt like I was in a bizarro universe. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? So I take responsibility. It's like we, instead of us picking up the banner and running forward, at least doing things the way that we thought, or making corrections from the civil rights movement, we decided was, you know, I'm tired of this struggle. I got to live. Right. And what you got from that was what you got right now with these millennials is people not giving a damn about the struggle, people not giving a damn about black people in general, and people Mm -hmm. only giving a damn about themselves. And when you have America um, where individualism is the key, you know, like an individual, if you want to give up your culture and just be an individual, you can make your money here in America. Right. Right. And so you have that being dangled in front of them like a carrot. Dare you know I what say I'm it, Olive, I, I just need to add this. That's the only way you can make money in America is that you yeah. have to give up. you you got to be an individual because if you try to identify. Uh-oh, he got cut off. What happened? I'm away from I think he got mm-hmm. cut off. 
I'm here. No, Minister dropped. No, oh. you're there, but Minister dropped off. He gonna he probably gonna call back. Let me just make a point yeah. while he um yep. I'm gonna wait for yeah. him to call back. Oh. My cousin my cousin just asked me about um Abernathy and um Jackson. I was telling them that they that they set Martin Luther King up. This is his first time hearing that. Wow, that's that, that's not surprising. <laughs> All right, minister's back. Sorry about that, y'all. I dropped. Um, no problem. Yeah, well, what I was saying, though, basically what we were agreeing on was that, you know, for you, oh, I'm sorry, exactly where we, we left off was, I've been told by many people that when you, uh, like, basically when you, set, you, when you sign up to work at certain places, they make you sign a form saying you are not part of any seditious movement. In other words, like, if you down with Black Lives Matter, if you down with anything that they see on TV, God forbid you down with something really radical, like the nation, Hebrew Israelites, or something like that, you can't work here. So that basically means that they're telling you that if you wanted to live a better quality of life, you have to completely deny any kind of speaking out for your people or anything like that. God forbid you try to do something for your people. And that you know, it, it promotes the individualism. Right. So, what was the Which question? Which leads to the question. Ask, yeah. You, okay. Yeah. What I wanted to ask you was, and, and you pretty much answered it. Like, like you gave the 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 examples that you gave, and, and the way that you said about muddy in the water is absolutely true. But that's the reason yes, why. Like when I when I posted the I'm not a mathematician post in the BIO right. um, group, I put right. An African American fund with full online transparency. See, the problem that right. people had with the Million Man March was there was no transparency. We have yet to right. get full transparency on how much was collected on that day and right. where that money went. Right. And that has been the talking point of everybody that I spoke to who actually went there or who didn't go there, but you know, who just you know knew about it. Was what happened to that money? Because I saw. When I was there, I saw a lot of cash being passed into them buckets. Oh, brother. You talking about the first one? You know what I'm saying? The first one. Oh, brother. Listen. I was there. I was seeing, and everybody, me. every brother was given a dollar or more. Now, if you got a million brothers there, giving a dollar or more of their money, and I, I mean, every single person that at least I was around was thrown into that basket. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, mm -hmm. I almost forgot. Before you, before you, I almost forgot this. This is something, that, and I want to get your opinion on this, because this is what I feel. Everybody always says that black folks don't do this and black folks do that. I believe that it's the exact opposite. Hmm. When Patty the Bell Pies came out, didn't black folks unite around that? Most definitely. What did Patty LaBelle make in, 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 <laughs> in like a weekend? <laughs> See, the problem is... Yeah, I really feel this, and I don't know how you feel about it, but I just want to get your opinion on it. When the intelligentsia or the people who call themselves leadership or even or whoever the person is that black folks got their attention on makes a decision that they want to do something, black folks usually in whole support it. Yep. They usually in whole support it. It used to be that way with Farrakhan. When Farrakhan was, was actually relevant to people, if Farrakhan said, I want you to be on Flatbush and, and Parkside at 5 o'clock, there would be a million people showing up at Flatbush and Parkside just because he said be there. No doubt about it. That's how much no power this it. dude had. Mm -hmm. And that's the most disappointing aspect of it is and and which leads back to my my question to you: Should that not be considered an indictment on black leadership and a litmus test for anybody calling themselves a leader? If they if you're not talking about an African American fund with full transparency and us trying to get these dollars to help us finance our own reality, then what the hell are you talking about? Why should we be listening to you? What do you exactly. feel about that? Brother, uh, listen, <laughs> you know, one of the reasons, you know, we became friends a couple of years ago, and one of the reasons why I love you so much is that you 
uh, crystallize a lot of the thoughts. And I think I'm pretty good at articulating my own thoughts and stuff like that, but there's certain things like uh, it's fragmented in my mind, and then I hear you say it, and I say, oh, shoot, that's what I was thinking. That's what it was. Listen, I agree with you 1,000%. If, in fact, you could talk about you doing this, you could talk about you doing that, blah, 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 blah. But to me, if you're not talking about putting together, I mean, everybody's talking about empowerment now and economics and money and things like that, right? Everybody's saying that the only way to beat white supremacy is to use money. Everybody's saying that, right? Mm -hmm. So now, who in the hell is talking about having a transparent fund, you know what I'm saying, that everybody could know what's coming in, what's going out, how much was collected day in and day out that you could all look at, how come nobody's talking about that? How come everybody's saying if you invest in this project, we're not going to let you know this yet, and we're not going to – nobody – listen, nobody is talking about that. You're right. So for me, as far as I'm concerned, I agree with you 1,000%, and what my opinion on it is is this. If you really want to know what people are about and how serious they are, this is the question that needs to be posed. Are you in favor of a transparent – fund for black people in America to build land infrastructure and nationhood. And when we say trans transparent, we mean completely as in more than two people know what's coming and what's going out. It's not in your name. It's not in your country, your, your uh, excuse me, company's name or any of your family members. It's for the people. Everybody knows. The white man is definitely going to know. We know. Everybody knows. And there is a nuanced plan that is going to be looked at and continue to be reevaluated by a council of people, men and women, who are smart enough to deal with finances so that we know that this thing is corruption. I mean, nothing's corruption-proof, but pretty much uh, almost corruption-proof. If you're not talking about that, then quite frankly, you got your own agenda and you're just pissing in the wind. That's pretty much my opinion. Exactly. Exactly. I tell people, it's like I feel my generation dropped the ball, man. Instead of us, and the funny part about it is we made the statement that we tired of the struggle and we ain't even struggle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, people, the people that came before us, you know, they can make that statement. We didn't even struggle. And I saw right with my own, I saw right with my own eyes. I went to parties. I saw, I saw, I would listen to uh, underhanded, under people talking under their breath. You know, uh, about, yeah, you know, man, you know, that's stupid, you know, this, that, you know, thing. You know, same thing that Black Girls Lost said. That was real. There was a lot of people that were hell-bent on hell and uh, uh, destruction. They didn't want to hear nothing about it. I remember when the Million March happened. I was talking to the sister about the Million March, and she looked at me like, what the heck? Uh, I, look, 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 you know, I, I got to get to the club. <laughs> yeah, you know what, brother? Like, Remember the other day on my Facebook page where I posted that picture of me and a couple other brothers and in the background is that, that Wu-Tang graffiti can it be all, all so simple? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, I, I post that periodically for a reason. And the reason being, that, first of all, because you see me there and I got hair. <laughs> and some people, you know, they know me as the bald-headed dude for so long, they don't believe I ever had hair. But the thing is, is this, you know, the way I look at it is this way, and, 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 and Staten Island, Wu-Tang, the whole Shaolin movement to me is a microcosm if we're going to talk about music. Because mm -hmm. when those dudes first came out, let's just, you know, never mind even the black struggle or any kind of uh, militancy. Those dudes' main mission, if you remember, was to bring the quality of lyricism back to hip-hop. It had mm -hmm. been right. a lot of singing and dancing and just, like, basically watering down of the lyrics. And Wu-Tang's mission was to bring back lyricism, you know, content, uh, subjects, things like that. And so, you know, you go to Staten Island, and we went there. You had the Wu-Wear store there, stuff like that. There were mm -hmm. other stores in Staten Island that was not down with Wu-Tang. They, they labeled their, their store as the Shaolin clothing store, the Shaolin groceries. I mean, you know, that city was behind them, brothers. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what ended mm -hmm. up happening, <clears throat> you know, because we went there, I, you know, we was dying to go there just to go sell papers and fish. And and, and real talk, uh, our, our Staten Island was one of our best fish cities. Like, it had a lot of brothers from the continent, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. A lot of brothers and sisters. For yeah, whatever, whatever reason. Staten Island. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Staten a Island. lot. 
and they would buy, you know, they would buy the whiting fish. So what you call it? Be that as it may, you know what I'm saying? We went there and we would sell. But you, you know what? What ended up happening? Slowly but surely, you started seeing the because you know Wu Tang blew up. They started making money. They started prospering, and Staten Island was starting to be neglected. So we would go to the Woolware store, which, by the way, was a hole in the wall, B. I mean, that thing was so scary. Yeah, Ray Wallace said it was a hole in the wall. We had, we had a Woolware store right here in Norfolk. We had a Woolware store right here in Norfolk. stayed here for a while. You know, we had a Woolware store. Yeah. And was the one that was, the one we were. had in Virginia was nice. Yeah, but we're going to get well, I, I bet you. I bet you it was bigger than the one that we had. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Way, this was, this was, was, actually, this was a showcase one, yeah. you know, the one they had here. Because Ray Kwan, Ray Kwan right. lived in Norfolk for a while. Right. So, so be that as it well, here's, uh, well, that, that's, <laughs> check out what I'm going to say next. So here's the thing. Like, we would go through there, man, and, you know, people would, would, would buy the paper, buy the fish. People were conscious since that now. I mean, you know, there's a lot of murdering and things going on. But people were definitely moving with their tides. But eventually yes, what you started seeing is, you started seeing, slowly but surely, you started seeing everything deteriorate, like, you know what I'm saying? For the longest time, that graffiti that we took a picture in front of, nobody touched it. You know, if you're if you, if you're familiar with the graffiti trade, like you you guys know that I, I was taught by you know this nice Puerto Rican how to do graffiti, and you know in the graffiti trade, a sign of disrespect is you going over somebody else's pieces. Oh yeah, yeah, or yeah, somebody's burner. You know what I'm saying? You'll say dude on Beach Street. That dude on Beach Street. Uh, the Beach Street spit. Raymond. Yeah, Raymond. Raymond. Remember that? Yep. Who was the yep. dude that was tagging on uh, tagging on on Raymond stuff? His name was Spit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what yeah, he's right. <laughs> he's right. Spit all over stuff. Yeah. So, so what happened was is that you know you had that can it be also simple and you had that two cent and and yo brother that was there for years and nobody tagged on it. You know what I'm saying? So what ended mm. up happening is slowly but surely that started deteriorating to the point where, and then one day we went to Staten Island and we was knocking on, I forget exactly what projects it was, we were knocking on doors. Ray Kwan came to the door on the project, brother. And I was like, what? You know what I'm saying? And he was like, fish man. I was like, because uh, my brother Saladin knocked on the door and he was like, uh, you know, because we used to knock on the door and say, fish man, fish man. And the dude came and said, fish man, fish man, what up, fish man? I said, no, that ain't the voice I think it is. He was in the projects. And I'm saying to myself, mm -hmm. what is he doing here? So the thing is, and then you would see him in the barbershop and stuff like that. So I think there was a lull in his money for a little while. But basically what I'm bringing all this up to say is this, is that if you go to Staten Island now, I mean, you know, it looks like there never was a Wu-Tang Clan there. That graffiti mm -hmm. is, is, oh, has okay. been painted isn't that over. Isn't the most disheartening thing? Isn't that the most disheartening thing? Yeah. It's, it's like... You know, Pretty soon, you're not even know there was black people in Brooklyn at all. Pretty soon, you're not going to know there was right. black people at home. There was like, yeah, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me just let me just finish the point real quick, brother. So, so what I'm saying is this. Them brothers blew up, right? They prospered. And when they prospered, the whole goal of we're going to bring lyricism and, and content and all that other stuff back to hip-hop, it basically just it, 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 it disintegrated. And this, to me is a small picture of what happened to the whole black movement. Everybody got into mm -hmm. the black movement, everybody was poor, and everybody's main goal was, yo, son, we are going to liberate black people, we're tired of this, we're going to give black people <laughs> food, clothes, and shelter, we're going to give them land, infrastructure, and nationhood. And then a lot of dudes got better at speaking, and the better you get at speaking, the more people want to pay you, give you donations, you shouldn't have to work for the white man, you should be free. So, you know, that started getting out of hand, and dudes start making 2000 3000 4000 hours here and there and stuff like that to the point that now you got a black millionaire, you know what I'm saying, just because he said that he was going to liberate the people. And when this happens, the next thing you know, the, the, the goal of liberating the people is no more, and it's, you know, brothers and sisters, we got to be sensible about what we're doing. We can't cause too much problems. And if you notice, at the end of the day, all of those who were there, they start speaking like that. Now, yes, I, I do agree with you, Holmes. There's a balance, and we do have to own our part. We definitely have to own our part. And I think that we in the BAIO, B -A -I -O, we are trying to fix that whole thing by doing what we're doing. But to me, if we want to talk about music and we want to talk about the shift in errors, then you have to, to me, my, my focus would be on the Shaolin era because so many years later, if you go to Shaolin now, because remember Megatron got shot, DJ Megatron got shot, you know, just going to a corner store or something like that. You know what I'm saying? So that, what they could have really done 
you know, to transform that community, ain't nobody trying to transform that community it's back to what it used to be. And and I can yeah, tell you Wu-Tang, God honestly. Wu Tang is aren't they Generation X too? Yeah, yeah they are yeah, Generation, yeah. generation X. Yes, sir. Jizza uh, yeah. was born in 1966. He's definitely Generation X, you know? Yeah, right. I, I, I put them in that same category, definitely. Right. But, I mean, that, that part that what I was telling you all about in the park, that was a moment for me. Like, that was, I, I looked at that and I said, damn, oh. things have shifted. The people yeah. who are not concerned about the people who were, who were actually – out there working in the interest of them, they were more concerned about this heavy as a head that wears the crown BS, bro, bro, like how bro, hard bro. it is to be a bro. drug dealer. Brothers and sisters, if you, if you look at the topic that was Bill said and the way that Brother Hollis um, developed it, you know, it's really self-explanatory, but it's like a lot of us really didn't think about it before you brought it out, which is, you know, to me, that's an amazing part of it, is that... You and I as a people, we do not demand a transparent fund for black people in America. And truly, completely 100% transparent. Everybody who has a fund, you know, will uh, release limited amounts of information to you. You know, they will tell you uh, a, a little bit of what's being done with the money, a little bit of how much is being brought in, but they can't tell you 100% um, of, of what's being collected because they have to scrape some off of it. You know what I'm saying? And they know how you would act if they did scrape something off of it. If you're going to kill, you know, and when I say kill, I, I say that term loosely or figuratively, you know, if you're going to kill some sister from Chicago for spending money um, from her GoFundMe, you know, what, what, what would you do if you knew what all of these black leaders are using your dollars that they say that they're supposed to be investing in wrong infrastructure nationhood? What would you do to them if you knew what they were doing with the money? What would you do? How would you react? How would the internet be if you knew, you know, the many coats that are being bought, the many cars that are being bought and stuff like that, the many, you know, uh, houses that are being rented, cell phones being paid, you know, ad nauseum? What would you do? And so for me, I think that we as a people, we need that, but the only way that we could have a transparent fund that is strictly for land infrastructure and nationhood is that we need to put together a council of people you know, men and women who check and balance each other and check and balance the funds that you can trust with high levels of integrity. You know, I did a show before called Dynasty Warriors High Trust Societies because from my studies of societies, the ones that last and are, are the most sustainable are the ones that have high levels of trust. And when you have trust not only amongst the officials, politicians, leaders, rulers, things like that, but when you have trust amongst the, the, the rank and file, the average citizen, then things get done quicker. I mean, you, you think about it. Let me just give you an example. If you trust me and I trust you and we're, we're, we're set to cut a business deal, that business deal would go through and be so much faster if we both had at least 90% trust in one another. But the reasons why business, business deals stall, the reasons why we cannot make money with each other as a people is because we, only, we don't even really have 30% trust. My street instincts tell me to hold back until I really know you. Your street instincts or whatever common sense instincts that you have tell you to hold back. And so it takes a long time for us to actually do something as a people. We can trust white folks. You mean, like, we trust them all day. And so money at them, like, you know, like it's a strip club. But when it comes to black people dealing with black people, we don't have the trust that we need, and this stops us from, from doing business with one another. There's some people right there out there right now that want to do business with me. But it's not that I don't trust those people, but I don't trust, you know, it's not that I don't even trust people, but I just want to be 100% sure that my money is going into the right place. It's nothing personal against them, but it's just that growing up as a black man in America, I've learned to be skeptical. Let me just put it that way. And so, therefore, if you live in an environment where there was, like I said, at least 80 to 90% trust, then we could have high society because trust, speeds along the process of business deals, trust speeds along the process of, um, of learning, trust speeds along the process of trading, it, it speeds along the process of uh, law making, ordinance making, infrastructure building, you name it. And this is the silent, uh, what you call it, the silent ingredient, the silent base chemical that is needed in order to build a black nation and a black society is true, 
true, unadulterated, highly satisfied trust. And so, therefore, we as a people, when, when Brother Hollis says that we need a transparent fund for black people in America, a transparent African-American fund, what he's basically saying is, that, and you know what's funny, some of you niggas out there will listen to that particular thing and you'll start arguing, well, we ain't Americans. Or you'll say, well, we ain't Africans. You mean like, listen, a fund is a fund is a fund. How about that? <laughs> But I'm going to say it like he said it, because I believe in it, which is a transparent fund for African-American, black, black people in America. We need that. That is 1,000% transparent so that everybody can have trust. And you want to know something? Think about it this way. You have a lot of leaders out there talking about doing this and talking about doing that. You know what I'm saying? And the reality of it, they say, oh, black people, you know, you guys are the worst. You can you, you couldn't even give me this and you couldn't even give me that. Well, frankly, you know why people are not giving you the money? Because you don't have a one thousand percent transparent fund. So people don't know where their money is going. Some people trust you, but a lot of people don't trust you. And the proof is in the pudding. Like I said before, you can say what you want to about about uh, you know, the the gentleman that called the the million man march, but the reality situation is not only did people show up from all around the country they threw money in the bucket twice, twice, no matter how you feel about them, no matter how I feel about them, you know what I'm saying? People threw money in the bucket twice, and it came from everywhere, okay? So the reality of it is until you have that level of trust, you are not who you say you are. And quite frankly, as far as I'm concerned, you know, Holder says that that's an indictment against you if you're not talking about a transparent fund, and I agree with that. What I would say in addition to what Brother Ola said is this. If you cannot, if you don't have 100% transparency and the trust of the people, you really can't say that you're the final frontier. You really can't. And so, therefore, this is something that we want, brothers and sisters. This is something that we want. This is what we want at the BAIO. We want to build 100% trust with black people by showing them that we are as transparent as we possibly can because the reality of the situation is that College Genesis, <clears throat> Minister Dow, Earl Hardaway, Jonathan Hill, Mr. Holicism, Chef Rob, Brother Dev, Brother Mark Cunningham, <coughs> Rodney, J we all as black men, and as well as the sisters that are with us, we all got our own careers, man. We all got our own source of money. We have our own source of livelihood, and we're all successful in what we're doing. I have never, ever been a part of a ring of brothers and sisters who are coming together to work for black people who are so successful in their personal life. It's usually everybody, you know, is trying to make a come up and they're broke or whatever, and because of their struggle and the growling of their stomach, they feel the pain and the growling in the stomach of the other black people, and they want to make a change. But here, we are all pretty much well-to-do. We're okay. I mean, we're not millionaires, but we're pretty much well-to-do. And the reality of the situation is, is that we are coming together because we're saying, even though I have made it, I have not made it unless my people have made it. So we have no problem saying, listen, we collected $300 today at approximately 10 o'clock. And you're like, what the hell does that hurt me? What does it hurt me? You know what I'm saying? I know that you ain't coming to my house to rob it because it's not in my house. <laughs> it's in a fun, it's in a, it's in a fun, in a secure place that we all choose, whether it be a black bank or a black institution, whatever it may be, you know what I'm saying? It won't be at nobody's house. It won't be in nobody's refrigerator like the congressman or anything like that. And, you know, so then you could, you could put your dollars behind us and you would know that, again, at 10 o'clock at night, we collected $300, everything is good. That, that leads to $10,665.22. Like, do you think that anybody that you heard on this line today has any problem reading that back to you like that? I, I sure enough wouldn't. I, I got um, I got another brother on the line. Um, your line is open three four seven. Peace. This is Hollip. How you doing, brother? How you doing? How you doing, brother? All right. Hey, we black and we shine. Tell me your name again one more time. Was it Hollip? Hollip. H O L I P. Mister Holipsism on YouTube. <laughs> Oh, what a what a great name! It's a pleasure to meet you, my brother. <laughs> How you doing, brother? Um, we black ask you a and question. we shine. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I want to ask you a question um, about the concept of an African American fund. 
because that was introduced um, by Farrakhan um, at the first Million Man March, and actually it was introduced by Elijah Muhammad before that. But I want to know what you how, and, and this is sort of like me throwing you an alley oop, but you know I got to do it. <laughs> Why is it that? the established black leadership has not endorsed the concept of an African-American fund with transparency is, and accountability. Mm -hmm. The thing is, is that they have actually thrown the idea out over numerous times. There was a time when Mr. Farrakhan had launched the um, three-year program for economic development. That was, what, 21 years ago. Um, there have been a number of attempts to do so. Of course, even the Guarvi organization was um, doing fundraising and uh, selling bonds. I think it's a great idea. Now we have to ask the way. What I have to ask the question: What is the best way in the current markets to do so? And according to my analysis, it would be to launch a "quote unquote" private equity fund. Now, I did, recently did a month-long series of broadcasts. I focus on one theme, two hours a day for an entire month. We did a month called Reparations for Real this time. And by the end of the month, we concluded the best way to finance the reparations in the nine categories that we choose to repair using our own resources would be to launch a private equity fund and to sell bonds to fund to to build this private equity fund up, and it's a really good idea. Most people don't know, and I was just um, just researching this. You know, I do a daily business news roundup. I was just researching this just in the last day because I got in an online debate with a couple of brothers, and I say, heck with the financial markets. We need to build our own private equity fund. Most mm -hmm. people don't know, and this is just reported, brand new news, of the top 30 of 300 Equity, um, equity funds in the country, the top performer is Vista Equity Partners. And most people don't know that Vista Equity Partners was founded and is chaired by Robert Smith, a black man, the hmm. richest black man in America. Most of us don't even know his name. But right. we should, and we should be looking at this idea of a private equity fund. It's not going to be that difficult to launch and to start, but it's got to be systematically done because it's going to have to pass the Securities and Exchange Commission monitoring. But, you know, we've already got the best-performing equity fund in America is headed by a black man. He's not necessarily interested in reparations, but I think that you and I should be. Yeah, I mean, and the, and the thing that it has to have, you know, because our people have had their hearts broken so many times and been screwed over so much, is the transparency so that people can see where, you know, how much that, you know, money is going into the fund and how those funds are being allocated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you familiar with how private equity funds work? Not exactly. Yeah. The word equity is key here. The word equity in financial markets means the when you take your um, when you take your company's assets mm -hmm. and your company's debts, you subtract the debts or obligations from the assets, and what is left over is called equity. So, with a private equity fund, once the fund is raised, the money is used to buy real. Things. And I emphasize that word real. It's not speculative. This is real. And right. done the right way, we could probably start off with a position. And I was, you know, I was talking about this three months before Christmas. So I said, instead of boycotting Christmas, instead of allowing our people for unconscious consuming, we should do what our parents used to do when I was young. For Christmas present, my daddy would buy us a $25 U.S. savings bond. And that bond would mature over the course of four years or so. He'd probably buy it for $17, $16, and it would be worth $25 when it matured. Well, we could get back to that. And in purchasing, say, a $25 um, reparations private equity fund bond, the bond could have a mature maturation rate, could be 10-year maturation rate. Because it is, these are equity investments, they're invested in real things. And we can find enough real things around the planet to invest in. Right now, most people are unaware that the powerful 
corporation that has dominated Africa for the hundred years, the Anglo-American establishment or the Anglo-American corporation based in South Africa, about three months ago, they fell on bad luck because of the global commodities downturn, and they now are being forced to liquidate 60% of their holdings and lay off 67% of their workforce of 135,000 people. 85,000 people will lose their jobs. They've also got a lot of very heavy mining equipment and refining equipment on the African continent. We could have purchased probably all of that had we only had the leadership that would directed us out of Christmas. Now, commodities, including the um, uh, industrial minerals, are down right now, and they were going to be down until this cycle plays itself out. But we could have bought that, but just put it in a whole position to sit on it, or better than that, move our engineers to the continent to take what we are now mining and move that into refining of these products into finished products and export them around the world. We could have had a major stake and upgraded our economic status on this planet, probably doubled it in the next 10 years, and we just had the type of leadership that could have said, here's the right move to make, and here's the time period in which it's going to take for this to complete itself. Let me throw another one at you. Let me throw another one at you. You, you talk about a, t- a time of the year where people do a whole lot of spending. That's the, the holiday season. That's Christmas. But another time is when you go ahead and when people go ahead and get their refund. They go ahead and buy a lot of crap they don't need. Two times a year there's, there, in America that, that, that black folks go ahead and throw their money right on the damn toilet. How do you feel about the uh, you know the tax refunds? Because a friend of mine sells cars, and he can't wait for tax season because he sells a lot of cars at that time. You're making such an excellent point, and, and I really hadn't thought about that until you mentioned it. But, you know, there have been people, when, usually when the subject of reparations comes up, and I've been, been researching, studying, talking with and about reparations for a number of years, so we're very well informed on it. Most people, when they think of reparations, only think about one thing, I'm going to get a government check. And then the next thing to come out of half of our people's pessimistic mouth is, well, black folks are going to just turn right around and give that money, that reparations money, right back immediately. And um, I would say that the tax rebate is probably about the best evidence of what people would do if given a direct reparations payment like that. And that's very, very unfortunate that we have such a mindset because in actuality, if our people were prepared to receive that tax rebate several months in advance, they would do things like, well, let's 10 households pull our tax rebate this year, and let's buy one of our 10 households out of all debt for the year. Erase all of their um, debts and usury expenses, pay off car loans, house loans, whatever, and then next year, the next one in the cycle will pay off their debts. Just in erasing debt, many households will see their household income rise between 6 and 15% per year. Now, wouldn't it be nice to be able to get a 6 to 15% raise for your household this year? The only thing we'd have to do is just believe and trust in each other. That's a good point. But I just, I really see, well, I think that should be the the message here for the next few months. Let's 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 go ahead and not throw our tax you know, your tax refund down in the toilet. It's really your money that you lend it to the government, but Well, and then the other side of that is is let's plan for next year of not allowing the government to take so much of our taxes. The best way to do that is to start more robust businesses and to invest in business growth. You know, uh, we talk about the equity, private equity fund. You know, that could be set up in a way to where the private equity fund bonds are themselves excluded from taxes until maturity, until the cashing in of those bonds. By the time we would have to pay taxes on them, there's a good likelihood that we may ourselves per household be owning 30, 40, 50 hectares of land in African countries. And before we even have to pay taxes 
on those reparations bonds. We're going to start thinking a different way. Other people already think like this, but they don't necessarily go out of their way to teach you and I how to manage long-term intergenerational wealth. We have to study what they are studying. We can reverse engineer those education classes and teach ourselves.